also works. Folks, oh, welcome. It's good to have us uh, having you here this morning as we come together in the house of the Lord to uh, just exalt Him and to focus our attention upon Him. I'm uh, mindful even this morning that uh, today out in the world it's been recognized as Father's Day and so there is a frenzy of activity around the issues of fathers and a celebration of that. And uh, what better place to be on the Lord's Day though is in the family of God, thanks Corbus, in the family of God just exalting Him and uh, focusing our attention upon um, our true Father, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be His name. And we certainly want to hallow Him this morning. We want to acknowledge His worth. We want to uplift Him and exalt Him and to consider Him as our heavenly Father who rules and reigns over all things well, even as we do come to celebrate and reflect on earthly fatherhood and families, which I will do so uh, later on in the service as we pray together. But with, the, with that in mind, let's uh, turn our attention immediately to the Word of God, Psalm 99. Our fellowship group were struck by the psalm and a number of the surrounding psalms a few weeks ago. And they're called the enthronement psalms. They just scream out the fact that the Lord reigns. And uh, this is one of them. Psalm 99 and just the first couple of verses as we come to worship this morning. Let's hear the word of God. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And folk, with that in mind, let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by his spirit to come and energize and enliven our worship together this morning. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we acknowledge right up front the very words of that psalm that the Lord reigns. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the one who is sovereign, that you are the one who is supreme. You are the one who indeed sits enthroned above the cherubim. You are enthroned upon the praises of your people. You are high and exalted above this earth. You are ruling and reigning over all things well. And uh, we acknowledge that with gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on Calvary, that we have access into a relationship with such a God that it is not just the, the Lord who reigns, the Lord who is exalted, some removed transcendent God, but indeed our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. And so, Father God, we thank you this morning for the very privilege of calling you that. Lord, we're thankful for the great uh, hope and confidence of our adoption into your family, that we are not just uh, brought into your people, but we are drawn into family, that we're sons of God, heirs of God, co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we do pray that as we proceed in worship this morning, probably with many things swirling around in our minds, even as we come to worship with what's happened in the week or in the last months or in the last year, that there are issues that we are grappling with. Lord, we do pray that the great confidence that the Lord reigns would be a rock and a beacon of hope for us this morning. Lord, we do pray that indeed as we wait upon you that you would renew our strength uh, like uh, the eagles cause us to rise along with them, to run and not grow weary and uh, walk and not be faint as we focus our attention upon you and acknowledge your worth and your might and your splendor and your power. So come and uh, pour out your spirit upon us as we come to worship this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I'm ask Edith Galbraith to come up and read our portion of Scripture for this morning. It's the passage I'll be preaching on a little bit later as well. And as soon as Edith's done, we're going to stand and sing together and just acknowledge the grace of God, even as we see reflected through this passage. Thanks, Edith. Our reading today is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? 
Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God <clears throat> by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, and so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Well, folk, won't you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Paul's epistle to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 3 this morning. As we continue journeying our way through this book that just uh, drips the gospel, in a glorious time last week at the end of chapter 2, just considering the great truths of justification by faith alone, and Paul has not ended on that theme. Uh, chapter 3 drives that further, chapter 4 drives that further, chapter 5 drives the implications of that further in terms of our lives and our actions and our choices and the fruit that we see in our lives. So this morning we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter one, uh, Galatians chapter 3, at least my apologies, verses 1 through to 14, but the thought unit actually runs all the way through to chapter 3, verse 29, and indeed into chapter 4 as well. So uh, in a sense, what we're doing this morning is part one of two, and uh, next Sunday, God willing, we will have a look at the, uh, what, what continues. And you'll immediately see it in the text, because in uh, verse 15, Paul then gives an example to illustrate uh, what we've seen in the verses 1 through to 14. But to d deal with, uh, or to do justice at least with that example needs time. I was tempted to race through that this morning, but uh, that would do an injustice to the, the weight of what we actually see, uh, tucked in verses 15 through to 29. But let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by His Spirit to come and to indeed help us behold wonderful things from His law this morning. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we are thankful for the great work of Christ. We are thankful for the gospel. We are thankful, Lord, for everything that we've sung. We're just acknowledging you as the redeeming God, the God of all grace. It is indeed amazing grace, uh, how sweet the sound by which we have been saved. You have taught our hearts to fear. You have caused the light to pour into our own eyes. You have unblocked our ears. And so, Father, we do pray that as we continue to journey together, as believers, that uh, you would help us to see the very foundations of our faith. Lord, we are mindful that these passages in Galatians are complex. They are at times even confusion, confusing. Uh, sometimes in our humanists, we wish Paul had written in a more uh, straight line Western legal framework. But Lord, we do pray for the help of your Spirit to just understand this God inspired passage, to see the big picture to have our minds informed and more, more particularly to have our hearts warmed as to what we have in Christ. Father, we again plead with you if there are any here this morning or catching up during the week on the video or even months after the fact as uh, this might be stumbled across on YouTube, Lord, we do pray that you would be gracious to rescue such from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of your beloved Son. Lord, we do pray that if there are any who are unjustified and unredeemed and walking in rebellion against you, you through the power of your Spirit cause them to see their need and to draw them into a faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And so come, Holy Spirit, and achieve your purposes in our lives 
And Lord, I do pray that you would bless the uh, preparation, flawed as it might be that I've done. But Lord, I do pray that indeed the words of meditations of my own heart and the words of my mouth would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my God and my Redeemer, as we come to approach this passage this morning. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. During the course of this last week, there was a frenzy down in Cape Town to get tickets for yesterday's W, uh, what was it, WRC, URC final that was to be played between the Stormers and the Bulls. And as the news feed started to give the news, it seemed that desperate fans, particularly down in the Western Cape, were unable to buy tickets as they got into Ticket Pro. They thought they'd done all the right things. They'd parted with their cash. They were pushing the right buttons, but were unable to secure that which they wanted. And uh, the Stormers, even as a union, need to, uh, needed to issue an apology uh, for the difficulties in buying tickets for the final that unfolded yesterday. People were desperate to know that they would be able to get in and have a secured seat. I thought I'd done everything necessary. I thought I was on track to get that little grubby piece of paper in my grubby paw, but at the end of the process, I wasn't sure that I was actually able to go to the game. In fact, similar uh, scenes unfolded uh, three weeks ago as well across in uh, Paris, in France, at the UEFA final between uh, Real and uh, Liverpool. Those that thought they weren't walking alone found they were walking alone on that particular day, didn't they? Sorry, that cut deep for some of you, I know. But uh, many, many frantic fans with tickets in hand were refused access and were blocked and were in fact tear gassed in the, st uh, in the streets around that particular stadium. And we saw the scenes as the kickoff was delayed because of the chaos. Those that were out wanted to be in. And there was this desperation. I thought I had it. There I am at the turnstiles. There I am at the fence, brandishing my ticket. It's legitimate. I thought I'd bought it, but now I can't get in. What more do I need to do to get inside that stadium to be able to enjoy the event? I thought I was guaranteed access, but now I'm not so sure and I'm concerned. And you can understand with masses of people how the emotions start to rise in those moments. Folk, I would put to you that the same plays out spiritually in our lives. The same issues arise and the same questions are asked, particularly about our salvation. How can I be 100% certain of my salvation? What do I really need to do to make sure that I'm right with God and that I'm headed for heaven? Have I really ticked all of the right boxes to make sure that I'm in the kingdom of God? Have I done absolutely everything that is necessary to make sure that I've got guaranteed access to eternal life and that I would genuinely be called a son or a daughter of the Most High God? Those are real questions. Those are questions asked by real people, and just like me and just like you. The people that are asking those questions are going through a season in their Christian lives where they are struggling with the assurance of salvation. And when those issues are not adequately addressed and answered, the lack of assurance continues to grow. And professing believers who have put their faith in Christ start to ask issues like this. What must I do, how must I work harder to, in, to indeed ensure the salvation that I thought I, I had? Do I need to be more obedient? Do I need to be more involved? Do I need to give more? Do I need to attend more? Do I need to be more religious? Do I need to go on more courses and more seminars? Do I need some other experience that comes after salvation to, to truly cement my, my faith? Many start to tag on other issues, Velcroing other things onto the pure gospel. Pilgrimages to the Holy Land some, somehow elevate you to a different level. Following Old Testament diets and rituals or uh, celebrating and adhering to the Old Testament festivals. Well, you can be a, a Christian and have Christ, but you don't forget all of that Old Testament stuff. You need that as well to, to truly make sure that you're saved and to truly make sure that you're spiritual and to truly make sure that you're right with God. 
Some of you might have even heard of the Hebrew Roots Movement, which is effectively advocating this position. We had a young lady in our church a number of years ago who now has moved out to the West Rand who was saved out of that error and that, that heresy where you need to be doing all of the Old Testament stuff in order to truly make sure that you're right with God. Folks, that's no different to what is happening, or what was at least happening in the first century. And that is exactly why the Apostle Paul put pen to paper to write the letter to the Galatian churches. He was aware of the confusion that was existing in their minds in that geographical area, the province of Galatia, particularly in the churches of Antioch and uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. Remember, folks, just by way of recapping where we've been over the last couple of Sundays, the Christians in that region were predominantly from a non-Jewish background. They were Gentiles, and they had not grown up under the law. They had not grown up as part of covenant community. These believers in these churches in Galatia were not regarded as Abraham's children. They did not receive the law as a guide. They, they did not grow up with the Torah being uh, effectively infiltrated into their brain cells. As, as Paul speaks in Ephesians, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They were outsiders in terms of the, the Old Testament, not part of God's treasured possession, the apple of his eye. And yet by God's gracious intervention in the lives of these non-Jews, these Gentiles, they had come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been well taught by the Apostle Paul and others. They had started off well. They had truly grasped the doctrines of grace and uh, knew that they were saved. But over a period of time, Satan wanted that undermined. Satan wanted the seeds of confusion sown in these churches in the region of Galatia. And so Satan directed a group of people down from Jerusalem into this area that were his agents, set to infiltrate and to spy out and to bring dissent among the ranks, as it were, in this area. They were known as the Judaizers, those that were promoting Christianity, but Christianity plus something else. You needed faith in Christ, but first of all, you truly needed to make sure that you were really and properly Jewish. You need, needed to be a proper Jew with a proper understanding of the law and a proper adherence to the law and to be living out the law to truly embrace Christ as Messiah, to truly be saved. In other words, the foundation wasn't Christ alone. The foundation was Jewishness. And on top of that Jewishness, you could then add Christ and the gospel and uh, the, the great hope of what he offers. That was Satan's strategy, to get those people into this area to teach and to cause confusion amongst these predominantly Gentile believers that they were missing something. You didn't grow up a Jew, and now you need to hit the put the car in reverse, as it were, go back and reconnect with that missing Jewishness to truly appreciate Christ and Him as Messiah. The result in that area was doubt. There was confusion. You can imagine the minds of these believers starting to spin. I thought I was safe. I thought I was secure. I thought I had my ticket to heaven, as it were, without being irreverent. I thought I had done everything that was necessary in Christ, and now I'm being told there's more to be done. I'm missing something. Something needs to be added on to this gospel that I appreciated and grabbed onto. I thought I had this faith-based assurance of what it truly means to be forgiven and to be justified and to be declared righteous in, in Christ. I thought I was heading for heaven and had eternal life, but, but now is it enough? And you can imagine the question marks that were swirling around uh, the skulls of these believers. What do I now need to do? Do I need to go back and learn the law? Do I need to get circumcised? Do I need to eat differently? Do I, do I need to put in extra effort to make sure that I'm, I'm truly saved? And so that's what they started to do. They started to work harder. Some of them were slipping back into Judaism, adding the law onto Christianity. They already had certainty, but now their certainty has been eroded, and they're trying to get certain again by doing stuff. 
by trying to be a good Jew, even though it was never required of them. And so the questions were swirling around Galatia. Are we truly part of the New Covenant community? Are we missing something by not observing the law? And folk, that is what Paul writes to correct. That is what Paul writes to address. And we pick up with that background in chapter 3 and verse 1. And look at the warm, fuzzy, loving words that Paul writes to these believers who are struggling with these issues. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? There's an, there's an element of, of anger and concern and anxiety as Paul writes to them. It's as if he's trying to look at them through, through, the, through what he's writing, and, and he's asking the question, Galatians, what are you thinking? In fact, you're not even thinking. It's as if somebody has bewitched you and spellbound you and somehow cast a spell over your brain cells that you can't reason anymore. Your neurons are not firing in your head. This is not an attack on their intellect. He's not insulting their intelligence in any way. He's not saying they're mentally deficient. But in an impassioned way, Paul is writing to them, challenging the fact that they have rejected the gospel that they've slipped in terms of their thinking, that they're starting to think irrational thoughts, that they're in a, a space where they're totally misguided in a, in a spiritual sense. What he's trying to communicate there in verse 1 is this, Galatians, you should know better, but you're failing to use your brain cells. Start thinking and start thinking clearly about the gospel and that which is truly important. But what exactly does Paul want them to be thinking about? What information does he want them to be re-grasping to see the error and to, in a sense, swing them back into line? What truths do they need to be reminded of so that their hearts can be assured again of their standing with God? That's effectively what we see in chapters 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul launches into an extended argument about the very basis of true salvation. And we can see that through the chapters that follow. And again, folks, as I said to you last week, Sunday, these chapters are intensely theological. There is complex, deep, rich theology unfolding here. And Paul does that intentionally. And we need to grapple with that intentionally. Paul wants their minds informed so that their hearts can be settled. He knows that just coming and patting, patting them on the head and telling them it's going to be okay and giving them some flavored milkshake is not actually going to address the real issues. He wants their minds fed so that their hearts are informed. And folk, we need to learn from that. As we're grappling with these issues, even in our own era, maybe you are, uh, superficial help is not what you need. You need to get fed rich, deep truth so that your hearts, in a sense, can catch up with you. The best remedy is exactly what Paul gives us, object of truth, as, uh, unfold, as unfolds in these chapters. But folk, our particular focus this morning will be chapters 3, verses 1 through to 14. Uh, Edith has already read that in full for us this morning, so I'm not going to do that again, but we'll just draw your attention to a few verses along the way. And in those 14 verses, Paul gives three key reasons for assurance of faith. They're rooted in God's grace. They're rooted in the issues of faith. He points us away from the law towards faith. And this is not just for the Galatians. I would venture to say to you this morning that this is for us. We need to be learning from these truths as we see the principles pulling through to our own era. God still saves by grace alone, through faith alone. And the reasons Paul gives us in this passage would be able to feed our own souls in terms of why we know because we know because we know that we indeed are saved and have the assurance of our relationship with God. And then, folks, as I said, next uh, Sunday, God willing, we'll dive into verses 15 through to 29 and see the illustration or the example that he uses uh, to flesh this out a little bit further. And it, it 
brings a richness to us. So for this morning, three key reasons for a true assurance of faith, as we see in this passage, all rooted in God's grace and the issues of faith. What's the first reason that the Apostle Paul gives to put out assurance of salvation to them and to us? And we, and we see that there in verses 1 through to 6. It is in our own salvation experience. We get assurance through our own salvation experience. Paul points them to what they had experienced themselves within their own lives and within their own hearts. Paul gets them to think about their own testimony, how they encountered the gospel, how they responded to the gospel, how they experienced the gospel, how they were transformed by the gospel. And he challenges them to look at their own lives, their own story, their own testimony by using a number of statements and provocative questions, getting them to think about where they were when they started with Christ. So as he challenges them about their own salvation experience, there are five questions and statements we want to consider just in brief this morning. And the first one, Paul pretty much looks at them and he asks the question, what's the basis of your own salvation? What was the basis of how you came to faith in Christ? And we see that there in verse 1. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Galatians, when you got to hear about Christ, it wasn't in some hidden way or closed way or papered over way or obscured way. Those that presented the gospel to you did it openly and publicly. Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as the only Savior through what He did in terms of His death and His resurrection. They were reminded of the centrality of the cross, the importance of the cross, the crucial nature of the empty tomb. They were taken back to what the Apostle Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose on the third day according to the Scriptures. There's nothing hidden, there's nothing obscure about the very grounds and the historical truths of the gospel. Galatians, that's what we gave you. That's what you heard. That's what you grabbed onto. That's, that's, what, that's what you embraced, the very simplicity of a crucified and a risen Savior. Why are you backtracking? Why are you going in reverse down the N1 highway? Why do you think that core, simple message needs to be supplanted or added to or shored up or bolstered in some way? Consider the simplicity of what you first believed and go back to the simplicity of what you first believed. Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified. There's a second area where he challenges them about their own salvation experience. We see that in verse 2. He asks a question. Let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Challenges them. Galatians, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it something that you did? Did you go somewhere? Did you go on a pilgrimage? Did you have a fast? Did you sit on a mushroom? Did you get in a trance? Did you, well, well, what exactly did you do to get the Holy Spirit falling upon you? Nothing. He came by God's grace and regenerated you. He came and He took your heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. He came and He indwelled you and gifted you and empowered you. It's through His ministry that you're able to see and understand truth. You're a spiritual man, not a natural man. It's His work that is sanctifying you and gifting you for ministry. You did nothing. You did nothing to get Him except the gracious working of God as you responded by faith. Why? Do you want to go back to the law and try and think that through doing stuff you can get the Spirit in an enhanced ministry of the Spirit? Linked with that and flowing from that, we see a question asked in verse 3 about how does your sanctification happen? How does your sanctification happen? Uh, Paul asks the question, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? How exactly are you growing? Through your own effort? What to a degree 
we're obedient. To a degree, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. To a degree, we wrestle against uh, sin and we st strive to put sin to death. But surely it's the Spirit of God at work within you, and that doesn't come through the law. That ministry of the Spirit is not worked up by human effort. It's something that God graciously gives to us in terms of us being baptized into one's Spirit and the Spirit's ministry within us. Galatians, your growth and your maturity and your progression in Christ is a gracious working of God through the power of the Spirit that is not dependent on any human effort at all. And as we with unveiled faces, gaze on Him, that we're transformed from one degree of glory to another, and this by the Lord who is what? The Spirit. Our very sanctification, our very growth, doesn't come through trying to be better according to the law and uh, God's legal standards, but it's the Spirit of God energizing us from within and helping us to walk in victory. There's a fourth question that we see there in verse 4, even as he reminds them of their own uh, story. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Galatians, remember what happened to you. You found Christ, you embraced the gospel, and as soon as you did that, you had crosshairs painted on your chests. Immediately there was rejection from friends and family. Immediately there was opposition. Immediately you lost business opportunities because you dared to name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Galatians, you went through hardship for the cause of the gospel. You were suffering and dying because you held to a crucified and a resurrected Savior because you knew it was real. It changed you. You knew it was worth dying for. And now, these people have come down from Jerusalem and they've told you that's not enough that you need something extra Velcroed onto the very faith that you were dying for? Seriously? You suffered for the pure truth, and now you want to abandon that truth? Wake up, Galatians. What are you thinking? You lost business and friends and family over that gospel. You were arrested and beaten and spilled blood because of the cross and a resurrected Savior, and now you want to dilute that message that you suffered for by tagging stuff on? and trying to bolster it up in some way. What are you thinking? Get real. Come back to those first principles that you knew and loved and suffered for. Fifthly, what about the supernatural miracles that you witnessed, which we see there in verse 5? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Where did the miracles come from in the early church? Was that worked up by something that you did in terms of your obedience? Are you trying to be Jewish, trying to stick to the law in a particular way? No, he's reminding them the Spirit of God was at work. As they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit came and exercised miracles, not least of which their own regeneration, the new birth, the fact that they experienced the miracle of being moved from death to life. And Paul challenges them through these various questions to look at their own salvation experience, to look at what happened to them subjectively, to look at their own story, and to realize that to add anything onto that is foolishness, it is folly, and to go back to that which they knew and loved at the start. Folks, as we consider just that first issue this morning, the first reason that Paul gives, we need to just hit the pause button and realize that nothing has changed. Believer, Christian, sitting here this morning, think about your own journey. Think about what God has graciously done for you by faith. How has He graciously worked in your life apart from any effort or goodness of your own? Think back to the pure, simple gospel that you received and that you responded to and how your love for Christ was sparked through that message. Think of the ministry of the Spirit as you were convicted of sin and you started to deal with sin and grow in Christ and, and your faith was being built up. Think of the joy and the delight that you had as a young Christian where you were flourishing and growing and maturing. Yes, think of the opposition from friends and family and neighbors and lecturers, but how you dug your heels in 
and you refused to, in a sense, give way to the undermining and the attacks that they were bringing against you. You didn't give a millimeter as you defended your faith. And then ask the question, was that real? Was that gospel real? Were those experiences real? Was the ministry of the Spirit of God within you real? Did you suffer and die, and not die, none of you have died, but did you suffer and uh, face that opposition for something that was real? And now if somebody comes and says you need something extra, tag something else on, you need to go somewhere or do something or give something or have a second experience or a second blessing or whatever it is, they're saying to you that that wasn't real. And what we've seen here through this inspired passage of Scripture this morning is this. Don't turn your back on that which truly gripped you at the first. Don't be fooled in any way, Christian, to think that something more is needed to truly make sure that you're saved or to truly assist in your growth or to truly make sure that you're in the kingdom. Look at the simplicity of what gripped and grabbed you at the first and hold on to those first principles, even as you see that fleshed out through your own salvation story. But folks, as we proceed through this passage, there's a second reason that the Apostle Paul gives to bring assurance. It's not just all subjective, looking at our own lives and our own stories and our own testimonies. What Paul does next is he, is he shifts to objective truth. He starts to use the Bible. He uses God's revealed scriptures as a means of bolstering the assurance of the Galatians, and I trust also us this morning. So the second reason is not rooted in subjective experience, but indeed rooted in objective truth. And we can see that there in verses 6 through to 9, as the Apostle Paul directs us to consider God's global plan of salvation. God's global plan of salvation. Of salvation. Let's have a look at verses 6 and following again. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Let's just hit the pause button right there. Again, folk, remember that these Gentile believers in this area felt like outsiders. They were beginning to feel like they were second-tier Christians, uh, second-class believers. The Jews, the true children of Abraham, had the inside track in terms of Christianity because they had the law. And so these Gentiles started to believe this, gen, uh, this Jesus plus kind of thinking, that we in a sense kind of need to become Jewish first in order to be real Christians. And Paul cuts right across that absolutely heretical thinking. Paul takes them back to God's original plan for salvation. Paul, in a sense, puts them into a time machine and he takes them right back to the beginning to see the very basis of salvation. What needs to really be in place for someone to be saved, for someone to be counted righteous before God, for someone to be justified? Now, the false teachers were coming into Galatia, and they were pointing to the law. They were pointing to the law of Moses. They were pointing to what was revealed at Mount Sinai and following. Paul, to counter them, goes far beyond that. It's as if he looks at them and he says, okay, you want to play games with the law? You want to convince these people and uh, bewitch them that the law is important? Let's go right back to the beginning of the law. Let's fly beyond David, beyond Moses, and go right back to the beginning, to the book of Genesis. You want to get stuck in Exodus and follow, following? Let's go right back to the beginning. And that's exactly what Paul does. He takes them back to Abraham. And he reminds these readers of his of how Abraham was saved, how Abraham was counted righteous, how Abraham was justified. And the answer is what? Abraham was justified by faith. Nothing has changed ever. 
Old Testament believers and New Testament believers have always been justified and de declared righteous by faith. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, we read this. And he, that's Abraham, believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Paul knew that verse. And Paul quotes that verse here in Galatians chapter 3. Why? What is Paul seeking to do? He's making the point, folk, that Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation and the nation of Israel, was not justified by the law. Why? Because he lived and died many centuries before the law was given. Moses, uh, Abraham predates Moses. Abraham predates Sinai. Moses, uh, Abraham predates the giving of the law, but on the basis of his faith, he was justified. In fact, it goes even beyond that. As we look at the chronology and the time frames of Abraham's life, it's possible that these Jews might look and go, ah, oh, but he was justified by circumcision. God gave a command that he would be circumcised, and because he was obedient to that, therefore he was justified, therefore he was declared righteous on the basis of what he did. But the problem is, this verse, Genesis 15 verse 6, is 14 years before Abraham was circumcised. He was declared righteous on the basis of his belief. His faith in God is what uh, caused him to be accepted by God. No action, no surgery, no procedure, no diet, no anything affected his spiritual standing between him and God. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteous. The sole and only basis of Abraham standing with God was his faith in God. The mere fact that he believed in God and the promises of God and took God at his word caused Abraham to be counted as righteous. As we fast track through the story, what happened? God then used him to form a nation, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. As we read in Genesis chapter 12, and the covenant is uh, developed through Genesis 12, 15, and 17, so we need to read all of that together. But Abraham was promised land. He was promised descendants. He was promised that he would have a great name. And the fourth aspect of the promise given to him was what? That you would be blessed so that you would be a blessing. And in Genesis 12, verse 3, we read that. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And don't miss this. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham, I'm going to form a people for myself through your lineage, the Hebrew people. They're going to be my holy nation. They're going to be my royal priesthood, my treasured possession, the, the apple of my eye. Those are going to be my people. But for what ultimate purpose? That through them as a nation, all the nations on the earth would be blessed. You see, folk, Israel was never ever the end goal. God's glory would be displayed as all people get exposed to who He is and the nature and the character and the glories of Yahweh. And Israel was supposed to be a conduit. They were supposed to be a pipeline of God's mercy and grace and power and glory so that everyone would see. Israel was never the end goal. The nations are the end goal. The non-Jews are the end goal. The Gentiles are the, are the end goal. People from every tongue and tribe and language and nation. That was the point. Abraham, you're going to be blessed so that through your descendants, everyone is blessed. And that's exactly what Paul is alluding to and picking up on here in Galatians chapter 3. The Gentiles were always 100% part of God's plan. Non-Jews were part of the plan of God to be brought into the new covenant community, which we know as the church. That is the issue. And so as non-Jews come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and embrace Him as Savior and submit to Him as Lord, what happens? In the language of Scripture, they are blessed. They are counted as righteous. They are justified. Here's the staggering thought that Paul was trying to impress on these confused Galatians. 
You're a believer. You're a believer. You're a non-Jewish believer, but you've got the same equal standing in the kingdom of God as the Jew standing next door to you. You stand equal. You're both saved by God's grace. You're responding with the same faith. Your ethnic background counts for, for nothing. There are no second-class citizens in the church, which is why he says what he says there in verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And you see the hope for these people who were way wobbly and shaky in their thinking when the doubts come, when you think that you lack nothing, when you think that you need to add something onto the pure faith in order to be saved, remember this, that God's plan for salvation was always by grace through faith for everybody who would believe. It was true for Abraham. It was true for the Jews in the Old Testament era. It's true for non-Jews. Jews who had no faith in God were actually not counted as Abraham's children. And non-Jews, Gentiles, who had faith in God are counted as Abraham's children. That is what our text is saying to us. God's global plan of salvation reminds us as probably all of us here this morning, as Gentile, non-Jewish believers, that we are true sons of Abraham through faith. It does not depend on our ethnic background. It does not depend on where you came from. Nothing more is needed. It never has been. It never will be. And therefore, we can stand confident looking at the global plan of God's salvation issues unfolding that we are recipients of that. And uh, therefore, through faith, we are brought into the new covenant community, into a relationship with them. That indeed, along with Abraham, we stand counted as righteous by faith alone. And that is a, a rock solid uh, issue that we cling to in terms of bringing assurance to our hearts and minds this morning. So folk, as we look at this passage, we've seen firstly how Paul points them to their own salvation story, uh, where they've come from subjectively. Secondly, he reminds them of God's global salvation plan that everyone, all nations, would be blessed by faith along with Abraham and his offspring. But there's a third issue that we want to consider this morning, and we see that there in verses uh, 10 through to 14. And that is Christ's redeeming work. Christ's redeeming work. Have a look with me there at verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. That's where the reading of God's word ends. Paul, in a sense, shows us our criminal nature, both for the Galatians and for us today, because nothing's changed. It's as he takes us into the very law chambers of God, and we see those dusty leather tomes on the shelves as he takes us through the legal offices, and we're shown volume after volume after volume of God's holy law. That which was originally revealed to Moses, but effectively it's the whole standard of God's revealed truth, teaching us that which is right, teaching us that which is wrong. The law are the standards of God, the statutes of God, the precepts of God, the ordinances of God, as we see many times through Psalm 119. The law is God's revealed determination of that which is honoring to Him and that which is dishonoring to Him. The law teaches us that which is acceptable and holy and that which reflects His glory as opposed to that which is unrighteous and that which discredits Him. And as we walk through with Paul, as he's showing us the, the law, we gaze, as it were, on the entire legal code that we need to know and that we need to follow and that we need to obey in order to please God. But the point is made as we go volume after volume after volume looking at the, the weight of God's revealed law that none of us meet it perfectly. In fact, Paul makes the point that if we fail to meet it, there are consequences. 
Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, as he writes here in verse 10. And what does he say? For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, quoting Deuteronomy, Cursed be everyone who does not what? Abide by a few things, some things, most things, 95% of things. What does Paul say there? Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. There is obedience that is required. That's staggering. That's crushing. In those moments, we feel the fact that the law is indeed a curse just pressing down upon us. For one minor infraction, one little white lie, that little attitude, that little root of bitterness that you, you have, that, that little cookie from the cookie jar that nobody knew about, you've, just one infraction means that you've broken the whole law. Paul shows us that. You're, you're a lawbreaker. And even as he shows us that, we, we kind of hear James piping up from the side as well, from James chapter 2, as he says, for whoever keeps the law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. The law of God, the holy law of God, reflecting the holy nature of God, demands obedience, and obedience in every single way. Moses wrote in Leviticus chapter 18, quoting God or revealing God's truth, you shall therefore keep my statutes and rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. You see, folk, knowing the law doesn't save you. Believing the law doesn't save you. Having a knowledge of the law and upholding the law doesn't save you. Only doing every single detail of the law could possibly save. What's the problem? If that's the requirement, if that's the standard, what's the problem? How will you ever have assurance of salvation if it involves keeping every detail of God's law? Can you imagine the crushing weight being brought against the Galatians? You thought you were saved by God's grace, but hey, you need to go back to the law, and you need to keep every detail of the law to truly make sure that you're right with God. Can you imagine the crushing weight being brought against these believers? Now I'm not so sure because I know that I'm a lawbreaker. The law is condemning me. The law doesn't save me. Israel failed, didn't they? As we read in Romans 10 verse 3, Israel being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. As a nation, they blew it. Maybe they look at the apostle Paul as a good Jew, but Paul blew it. He describes himself as a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent op opponent, one who acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the point is the law doesn't save, it just condemns. The law shows us how bad we are before God. The law reminds us that there is no hope of ever achieving acceptance before God. It is a curse to sinful people. It is God's judgment on the sinner. And then somebody comes and tells you that to truly be saved, you need to go back and start doing the law and start eating right and start dressing right and having a couple of little surgical procedures to truly make sure that you're right with God. Can you imagine the confusion? If that's what's required, I'm never going to get that right. And it under undermines the gospel. To think that keeping the law is going to add to your standing with God is, is crazy. It just racks and stacks up even more condemnation against us. And folk, that was the problem in the Galatian churches. Adding the law back onto the gospel was stupid because it was impossible. It had always been impossible, and to try and re-inject that thinking was just uh, adding impossible to impossible. Which begs the question, how do we ever have assurance? When you doubt and you get told that you need to upgrade your salvation ticket from economy class to first class by the law, what do we actually rest on? What's our hope? What's our, what's our confidence? Paul teaches us this in verses 13 and 14, see the hope, see the solution, see the remedy to this crazy farcical thinking. Christ redeemed us 
from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Where does Paul point us? To Calvary, to a cross, to a Roman piece of wood that was nailed together, bits of tree. To, hang, to be hung on a tree was the ultimate insult, the ultimate offense, ultimate humiliation for the Jew. But what happened to Jesus Christ? He was crucified. He was hung up. He was hung on a tree. He was not stoned to death. He was not suffocated. He was not drowned in the, 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 the Kidron River. He suffered the most extreme form of execution, but the most humiliating as well. Why? So that what he did on the cross achieved forgiveness and atonement for us. As Peter writes, he himself bore our sins in his bodies on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died carrying the full weight of the sin and the guilt of all who would ever believe in him. All of the sin and the transgression and the shame of every lawbreaker who would ever be saved was credited to Jesus' account there on the cross. Every single transgression against the holy law of God committed by all believers of all time was carried by Jesus on the cross. He bore the curse that we were under. We were the lawbreakers under the curse of the law, but he assumed all of that in himself, and he bore the curse for us. He wasn't cursed because he died on the cross. He became the curse as he died on the cross for us, drinking the cup of the Father's wrath against your sin and against my sin. He became the curse as he suffered and died as the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of the world. He became the curse as he died the death that we should have died for our guilt and our condemnation and our shame. That's what we see there in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He did it all. He paid it all. He covered it all. There was nothing more to be done. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. There's nothing more to be added to his work on the cross. Praise God for that. With what result? With what result? With what outcome? Have a look at verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to who? To the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The blessing of Abraham, folk, is just Paul speak for justification by faith. That's what it means to be counted righteous. That's what it means to be approved by God, to be accepted by God. The gift of the Spirit is the sign and the seal of salvation that true believers, only true believers get to enjoy. And both are ours, how? Through what we do, through what we've done, through some effort? No, through faith in Jesus Christ. That in Christ, through faith in Christ, the blessing of Abraham and the promised Spirit come to us through faith. Gentile believers lack nothing. And that's Paul's point. Salvation is fully and finally and perfectly achieved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The legal demands of the law for all believers have been fully paid at Calvary. And so, when you come with your question, how do I get in? How, am I assured of, of access? Am I, am I truly saved? What more must I do? Maybe I need to go back and, and try and play around with the law and be a little bit more Jewish. Paul says, no, don't go there. Look at Christ. Consider his redeeming work. There is nothing, nothing, nothing more to be added beyond what he accomplished for you at Calvary. Lifted up was he to die. It was finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a savior. He paid it all. Am I assured of access? Yes, you are. Am I truly saved? Yes, you are. What more must I do beyond the simplicity of the gospel and faith in Christ alone? Nothing. Nothing 
at all. The believer through faith in Christ has 100% access to God, to salvation, to life, to heaven, to the new heavens and the new earth, to the presence of God dwelling with His people for all eternity to come. Nothing can be added to what the Savior has already done for you. You want grounds of assurance? Look at the redeeming work of Christ on Calvary. Look, the Apostle Paul doesn't end there. He continues to build on that. He gives an example. He fleshes this out in verses 15 through to 29 as he talks about the believer's union with Christ and uh, deals again with the complexities of the law. We'll get to that, God willing, uh, next Sunday morning. And those who are in Christ have access to God, which we uh, see there in verse 27. Just jump right down to the end of the chapter. We can see how the thought unit comes together. Verse 27, Paul says this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, nor male nor female. Why? For you're all one in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, is according to promise. There's no reason to doubt. There's no reason to be wobbly. There's no reason to think that you're a second-class citizen in any way. Christ has paid it all, achieved it all. Paul then drives it into family terms. He uses uh, adoption as a way of arguing this in chapter 4 as well. But folk, all of this is feeding into that one key crucial issue that salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and that you add nothing and can add nothing and should stop trying to add something. There is nothing to be added to gain extra assurance. Your salvation ticket in Christ, as it were, is all that you need by faith. Folks, we tie the threads together this morning. If you're a believer sitting here and doubting, thinking that in some way you need to add more to what you already have, stop. Let no one bewitch you, O oh foolish Randbergers, this morning. You are counted as righteous by faith as you rest in what Christ has already done for you. No effort saves you and no effort keeps you saved. You rest in Christ alone. And if somebody ever comes to you and tells you that you need to do something or tries to suck you into a system beyond Christ alone, run, run, it's wrong. If someone comes and promises you some form of second blessing, a, a spiritual secret to, to unlock a higher plane of spirituality or some additional experience of God's grace by what you do to receive more of God and more of Christ than what you got at conversion, run. Run from that because it's in Christ alone. Non-Christian, Satan will come and Satan will try and deceive you even more than you already are. He'll feed you lies that you can reach God on your own, that you through your own effort can do something, your own morals, your own ethics, your own goodness, your charity, whatever it is that can make you into a good person that God has to accept. Satan will come and tell you that you need to go on a pilgrimage or uh, have some religion where you can do something, attend Mass, say a couple of Hail Marys, whatever the case might be. It's adding to the simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All that Satan is doing through that error is accelerating your passage to hell. And I encourage you, non-Christian this morning, see the glories of the gospel. See the Savior who suffered and died and rose so that you could be set free. See God's grace reaching out to you, offering you the forgiveness and the righteousness that you so desperately need through Him, not through your own. And through faith, won't you reach out to Him and embrace that life-transforming gift that He offers so freely. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's all you need to do is throw yourself on the Savior. Won't you do that this Lord's Day? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the very simplicity of that. We can understand how this message cuts across, even in our own age, so much where Satan is trying to blind and confuse that it's about effort, that it's about work, that it's about adding things onto the gospel. Father, I pray, shore up the faith of believers by causing them to look back at their own experience 
course, shore up the faith of believers by considering the glories of the global salvation plan of God that it's always been through faith for, 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 through faith for those who would believe. Cause us to leave here this morning bolstered because we've again considered the cross and the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ where he became that curse for us. Lord, we do pray, cause us not in any way to be academic. Cause us not to get lost in the complexity of Paul's detail, but to see the wonderful, crucial truths of what we actually have in the gospel so that we stand on, those, on, on, that, hope and, uh, on that hope alone. So continue to do your work even beyond this morning through the power of your Spirit to teach us, instruct us, and encourage us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And as we close, let's consider the benediction from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's go into this week with those great truths ringing in our hearts and minds. Amen.